Welcome to another thing. I'm Larry Menti. Our economy is undergoing a seismic shift under our feet and before our eyes. And most economists will tell you we're not ready for it at all. As we slowly shift to more reliance on technology, science, robots, and the internet, the country's going to be looking for programmers, engineers, and coders, and we just don't have enough. Our topic today is the new economy and its effects on the workforce and our lives. We begin our coverage with Ellen Kolodje. Ellen. Thank you, Larry. Well, here's a scary number. The World Economic Forum predicts that 5 million jobs will disappear over the next five years, all because of artificial intelligence and robots. But one expert here at Villanova University, he says things aren't as dire as you might think. For decades, workers cleaned hospital rooms with good old fashioned elbow grease. Now, ultraviolet light robots do a much more thorough job in a fraction of the time. I mean, even industries like the hospitality industry, for example, which you would think, well, it's a personal touch, always going to be people. Well, look what's happening in Japan with you've got robots that are greeting guests in, in popular hotels as prototypes initially, but where's that going to lead? <laughs> Professor Stephen Andriol of Villanova says it's inevitable that robots will eventually replace millions of workers, especially in manufacturing. Japan is leading the way with 1,520 robots for every 10,000 workers in car plants. But Andriol says there's no need to panic. The question is, so who, who benefits and who loses? Well, somebody creates all those artificial intelligence applications. Somebody creates all that technology that enables all this. There's a lot of very sophisticated algorithms that go into this. So there's maybe that's the future. He and many others say we need to invest more in educating kids in science, math, and engineering to replace the jobs that technology will take over. A study by Bank of America says jobs with the highest risk of being replaced by robots include models, sports umpires and refs, paralegals, telemarketers, insurance agents, bakers and butchers. But it's not all doom and gloom. This is a whole new set of jobs or professions that are going to be opening up going forward. So I'm optimistic, I'm not pessimistic. I mean, the conversation about all these jobs being displaced, I want to focus much more on what gets created, what new jobs get created. The Bank of America study says the jobs least likely to be taken over by robots include ones that have intuition or empathy involved. So if you're thinking about changing careers or trying to decide what to major in in college, you may want to consider becoming a doctor, a social worker, or a teacher. Reporting for Another Thing, I'm Ellen Kolodje. All right, thank you, Ellen. To talk more about the new economy and if we are prepared for it is Donald Sebastian, who is the president of the New Jersey Innovation Institute. Thanks so much for being here. So let's talk about what the new economy is. The, the, the new economy is a digital world. It is a new science world. It is a new robotics world. You go ahead. You go from sure. there. Well, I think you've hit the, the, the highlights. Uh, what's important to understand is that we have really almost all of our major industries facing what one might call disruptive technology shifts. The basis of science, if you will, that's held them together for almost 100 years is transforming, and that's both a challenge and an opportunity. So the Internet of Things is not just a slogan, and it's not just uh, a new version or a new wrapper on the dot-com burst. The idea that you can now have smart sensors and communications capabilities that infuse every product and connect it with high-speed communications, wireless, back to a cloud of infinite computing resources opens up the opportunity to revolutionize every single product. You know, I like to look back at the period in the late 1800s to early 1900s when electricity became a utility-grade commodity. We love Edison for the light bulb, but it really was his invention of the electric utility that revolutionized everything. Ice boxes became refrigerators because they can have an electric compressor. Uh, flat irons became electric irons, electric ranges, home appliances, vacuum cleaners. Industrial machine tools didn't have to be close to a river for, for water power, right? You could now have both small scale and distributed capabilities in the manufacturing sector because of electric motors. Uh, uh, horse drawn trolleys became electric trolleys and on and on and on. Elevators that existed but only in centralized locations with a big steam engine could now be something that had the power in the roof. So Was that an easier transition though than what we're going through now or was it the same? Can, can you make that analogy? Yeah, I, 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 I took a look 
at uh, some historical documents from Newark in the late 1800s. And the bad news was that they, they, they talked about, you know, 100 companies that closed in the last year. Mm -hmm. The good news was 120 were created. And, and that's what we need to do, is take advantage of the potential shifts here and recapture our ability not just to innovate, but to make, to take ideas and dreams and be able to make them and turn them into a new generation of products, which means that we have to be able to be masters of the next generation of manufacturing technologies too. Not just the soft side of computer programming, uh, uh, but, but also the hard side, the hard side of goods. Uh, and you're beginning to see the tip of that now with uh, things like this uh, Nest uh, thermostats that are, have intelligence built in, uh, front doorbells that now have integrated cameras and allow you to connect to see who's at the front door, even if you're not home, and talk to the person so that you don't give away the fact you're not home. These are just little consumer examples of this wave that's coming of the integration of uh, advanced sensors, communications, and the back end of smart computing systems that are able to make amazing decisions and collect information from all of these and inform us. In, in it goes well beyond that. That's just what's going to be in our homes, but yeah, yeah. I, was still, I was just talking about before we went on the air about the fact that there's been a truck for the last year and a half in Nevada that's been making deliveries, and pretty soon they're going to be national. There's no driver in that truck, right. and they have a, it has an impeccable safety record. The deliveries are all on time, and they can drive overnight. Nobody has to sleep. And so how many truck drivers will be out of work? And what do they do? And and how they're that's just one industry. You can go on and on and on with the with the advance of robotics. But I guess people need to program them. They need to program them. They need to build it. They need to program it. It needs to be serviced. It needs to be maintained. And so all of these things create a new generation of jobs. So long as we are preparing our uh, our workforce. Ah, uh, and there's the that. that's yeah. the question. Are we? So I, I I've. Pleased to say, after a long time of feeling very badly about this, that I've seen the tide of interest shift for what we call STEM careers, science, technology, engineering, and math. We reached a point uh, less than a decade ago where the level of interest from high school graduates in New Jersey was, was less than 3%. At the same time that the demographic, the number of high school graduates was going to continue to decline. Well, that's horrible news when you think about all of the job opportunities that require even just a basic understanding of math and science that we have left to drift away in, 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 in much of our educational emphasis. It's coming back. Right? So it is now hip to be square. Uh, that, that it's not just for the nerds and the geeks to pursue these things. And so I'm a little more optimistic that we're seeing the kind of uh, uh, tide of enthusiasm for these opportunities that maybe hasn't existed since I grew up in the space era. But you think we are to the point now where enough high schools are teaching code? I mean, that's one of the problems, right? No, I, I, and again, these, these are not things that get solved in a quick flip of the switch because you have to have people in that environment who also understand how to do it. And so we have this almost a generation gap in which uh, real hands-on understanding and passion for math, science, engineering and technology ha has sort of been uh, removed from the typical diet for people who go into become K through 12 teachers. And so we need to do something to train the trainers, so to speak, right? There, and, and schools like ours, because that is our core essence, right? We're, we call ourselves a polytechnic. We're not just an engineering and science school, but it certainly represents half of our enrollments. And it informs how we do things in other curricula, like how we teach management, how we think about uh, organization and organizational management. Are other our, countries better at this? Well, it, the, the tests say yes. Right. I mean, are other countries better at teaching code? I, um, what I'm worried about is when they're looking for programmers and there's not enough in this country, are they going to go elsewhere? Well, Just are. like manufacturing did. Oh, they already are? They already are. Right. We already, we already find that there are uh, high-paying technology jobs that are posted on the state's uh, job available website that are going unfilled and are requiring employers to do uh, the H-1B uh, visa process to bring in talent to do that. So. It's not that we have all the answers here and we're ready to displace that, but at least we're recognizing it's a problem. Ten years ago, nobody thought it was a problem. It was, it was thought that's fine. Well, you know, we thought it was fine to let manufacturing drift offshore, and we're paying a serious price now for not being able to make the things that we imagine, because we're now finding that people who know how to make things have imagination too, and they don't necessarily need our ideas to come out with clever products and things that appeal to our market. As we wrap this up, is it fair to say that your position is that uh, you are pessimistic short-term but optimistic long-term in this? That's a good way of saying it, right? Yeah, because you can't solve a problem if you don't believe it's a problem, so we're at the stage where at least we recognize that this is important to be a problem to be solved and hopeful that the good old American Yankee ingenuity will come to bear to understand that we need to gear up in the same way that we did back in the Sputnik. And you'd recommend that schools right now think seriously if they don't have a code program of getting a program where they teach code? 
teaching coding, teaching not just basic science, but even engineering, very different skill set, to solve problems as opposed to create scientific understanding. These are all things that, that are part of the ambitions of STEM curriculum. We really got to ramp it up. That was fascinating. Thank you so much. Glad to Come back you. soon. Donald Sebastian, president of the New Jersey Innovation Institute.